Thanks so much for joining us today. We'd love to know how God is using this ministry to touch your life. So please take a moment and send us your story by going to ChristianLifeRantool.com and clicking Amen Central. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed today's message. Father, as, as the psalmist has written, teach us, Lord, to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Father, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of our heart, God, Lord, be acceptable, Lord. May the power of the Holy Spirit breathe life into them so that, Lord, we are changed, we're transformed. We learn, Lord, humbly. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing our series today. We're in the third week of a four-week series. What would I do if I knew I only had one month to live? It's based on a book that's been written by Carrie and Chris Shook. I encourage those of you who like to read, get this book. It, it, they, they are tremendous communicators and do a marvelous job in communicating through the length of the book. Last two weeks, we've been challenged to live passionately, and to love completely. Today, our challenge is, and I pray by the grace of God, that we'll learn how important it is that we learn humbly. And and I will tell you that there's just going to be a lot of emotion in me today. I'm learning how much I haven't learned and how much I have to learn. Um, Jesus Christ lived passionately. He loved completely He learned humbly, if you can believe that, and he left boldly. So we're doing this today, and and, and our our purpose in everything we say and everything that we do today and every day is to bring glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we're also doing this in kind of the one-year anniversary of the death of our founding pastor, John Bonacorsi. Um, John died June 21, 2015, and... A lot of you maybe don't even know who I am or you know, why I'm up here or anything like that. Let me, let me just give you a little brief introduction. My wife and I came to town in 1975, and one of the, the first couples that my wife and I met and became friends with were John and Barb Bonacorsi. And you know, John was a businessman, and, and I'll tell you, he was very passionate in his business about developing real estate along the interstate. And he did a very good job, and he'd done a lot of it, and it was his passion. It really motivated him. And then things began to change, and in in September 1978, my wife and I had come home from a marriage encounter, which was intended to to make strong Christian marriages stronger. The problem was, I wasn't a Christian, my wife was wavering, but I knew we were in trouble. I knew we were in trouble. We got home that Sunday night, and we kind of felt like maybe we're going to try to put one foot in front of the other. And here it is, late on a Sunday night, where my wife and I are living on a rented house on West Grove, and about, I don't know how late in the night it was, Sunday night, but here comes a knock on the door, and it's Barbara Bonacorsi. And Barb's normally pretty effervescent, kind of bubbly, outgoing. Well, she was on steroids that night. (laughs) Well, it turns out her husband and she had been baptized, and she started talking about Jesus. Well, that was my cue to exit the room, okay? (laughs) And what began that night and has continued to today has been a lifelong relationship of learning from John and Barb Bonacorsi about what it means to live passionately and love completely. I just want to, I've gone through lots of scrapbooks the last week, and that's why I'm a little bit emotional. Some pictures kind of depict how I've learned from them. I learned what it means to be a father from John. He, he was a tremendous father, teaching his children, continuing to teach his children after they were adults. He'd pay them to read books because he wanted them to learn. Other ways that I learned from him. As a member of community, you look at this picture, and it's a, uh, back in the back of John and Barbara, Ron and Joe Mulvey, who used to be pastors, teaching about church community. John and Barbara were so plugged into this church community, something happened in this church, they were there. And they surrounded themselves with people whose giftings were different. Ron and Joan had a tremendous ministry of compassion. And and John and Barb said, this is not our strength. We're going to get it. So Ron and Joan were plugged in. So he taught us a lot about living in church community. Next, he taught me what it meant to be a family man and a husband. And and I I will tell you, even as I stand here today, and I may share a little bit about this, I'm I'm still learning that I haven't learned some of the things that I need to learn. But he was a tremendous, he was all about family, all about being a good husband to his wife. 
about being a pastor and a leader, we went to Washington for Jesus in the late 80s as two couples. And it was a tremendous learning experience just to be with them for that, that, time, of, that time of being. Being a mentor, John was all about teaching, mentoring men, mentoring, had many sessions where he mentored men and wanted us to learn what it meant to be a man, what it meant to be a leader, what it meant to be a man of God. And so through this lifetime, oh yeah, we also had fun, on, by the way. <laughs> we loved to kick the boys around in the golf course. It took us a while to learn to do that, but you know, we old men, we got smarter with age. Every once in a while, we could beat those young guys. So we had fun, too. And John did love life and loved being a part of life. But as, as the years progressed from 1978 to 1984, the passion that John had for his business and his life got redirected because he found something that he could be even more passionate about than this business that he learned so much about and he spent his life developing, and that is a passion to lead others to Jesus Christ. And so he gave up, he forsook that which he had been chasing his life for a better, bigger dream that he could plug into with all of his might. And that's what John and Barb did. They forsook in a way that none of the rest of us who are with them forsook everything that they've been chasing to follow Jesus Christ and help us learn his ways. So I am a little bit emotional about that. Um, the title of this, word, this week's message is Learn Humbly. Learn Humbly. You know, for, for many people at the end of their lives, they become humbled. You know, people get ill, they get sick, they become bedridden, they become hospitalized, they become completely dependent upon other people. They become humbled in that because they know that they're so dependent upon others. Whereas when we're young, we're strong, we can do it. If it has to be, it'll be me. What we learn as we get older that that's not the case. That's one way we're humbled. The other way that we're humbled is all of a sudden we get to the end of our, the rope, the end of the line, and we, all that we've been chasing, all that we've been dreaming for, all that we've been wanting, we get to the end of our life and we say, is that all there is? Is that, is that what this life is all about? And so we have to take a step back and say, boy, did I miss it. You know, I, I want to talk a little bit about Jesus and, and the way he portrayed himself. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, one, and they're in the upper room, and one of the disciples said to Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus said, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In Hebrews 1, the writer says, Jesus was the exact representation of the Father. In Colossians 2, Paul wrote, speaking of Jesus, in him, in Christ Jesus, dwells the fullness of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So in other words, when you looked at Jesus, you saw the Father, in, at least in his character and his attributes. You know, there's only one time, one time in his entire ministry that Jesus talked about his character. And that was in Matthew 11. And he was entreating his disciples, and he entreats us today in the same way. In Matthew 11, 28, 29, Jesus have, has this conversation. He says, come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus, the exact representation of the Father, I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So Jesus, the exact representation of the Father of God, is saying to me, come unto me, learn from me. I am humble and gentle and heart. So he wants us to learn. So the question you might ask, I certainly have asked and hope that you would want to ask, well, what is it I'm supposed to learn? What is it I'm supposed to learn humbly? What is it I'm supposed to learn humbly? I'm a child of the 60s. I grew up in the 60s. How many of you guys grew up in the 60s? How many of you grew up with the Beatles like I did, okay? The Beatles, they, they could sing anything and it sold a million records. <laughs> One of their songs was, and I'm just going to read you the words. They sang the song, Nowhere Man. He's a real nowhere man, living in a nowhere land, making all his nowhere plans for nobody. Does not have a point of view. Knows not where he's going to. Isn't he a bit like me and you? And not to be outdone, one of the Beatles' rivals in the 60s was the Kinks. 
And see if this might describe the life of your parent, if not yourself. Because he gets up in the morning and he goes to work at 9 and he comes back home at 5.30, gets the same train every time. Because his world is built around punctuality, it never fails, and he's oh so good, and he's oh so fine, and he's oh so healthy in his body and his mind. You know, as we grow up in the teens, and we could be, my, my nephew, who's going to Liberty uh, University this fall, his mom was saved through the witness and testimony of my wife, who was saved through the witness and testimony of Barbara Bonacorsi, has three children all following God devout, devoutly. He's, he's now entering a phase of his life where he's going into college, and he's kind of, okay, what is my purpose? Why am I here? What, what, what am I going to be doing in life? And that really was the same question I was asking myself in the late 70s. Catherine and I had been married a couple years. I was getting up. I was going to work. I wasn't nine. I wasn't coming home on the train. But it was kind of like we're on this treadmill. Is this all there is to life? I go to work. I have kids. I come home. I play golf. Is that what this life is all about? Why am I here? What am I doing? What, what, is there any meaning to this life whatsoever? I eat, drink, and be merry. And so... As we started to relate more with John and Barb and some of our other friends, we started to ask ourselves the questions, is there not more? What is it then? What is it that God wants us to learn? And it's this. He wants us to learn that we are loved. We are a child of the king of the universe, gifted by God, loved unconditionally by God, called by God to use those gifts to bring him glory by living out a purposeful life, a fulfilled life. Now, at the risk of being redundant altogether, I am a child of the king of, come on, with me. I am a child of the king of the universe, gifted by God, loved unconditionally by God, called by God to use those gifts to bring him glory by living out a purposeful and fulfilled life. That is why, folks, we are here. And if you're standing, sitting, scratching your head, said, gee, I didn't know that. Well, join the club. Because we've all probably been there at one point in the time. You know, one, one of the things that Pastor Barry said a couple weeks ago that Pastor John had as his goal, his mission in life, was to what? Add value to the life of people. John was an encourager. He saw himself as a Barnabas, always trying to, you know, Help people. You know, I worked in a macaroni factory, one of my jobs growing up. And I, and I tell you, I am the, the least mechanically minded person in the world, and I'm proud to say it. And I was running this, this line that spit out bags of one-pound bags of macaroni. We'd put them in a, in a box, and then we'd box them up, and we'd seal them up and put them on a pallet. Well, this is the third shift, 11 to 7. And they were depending on me to fix this machine if it went wrong, which is like asking that wall to fix a machine if it went wrong. No clue. And there was a maintenance foreman, and if he had been willing just to impart a little bit of understanding, he'd come in at 7 o'clock, I'd been throwing things at the machine trying to get it to work. If he'd imparted to me just a little bit of wisdom, we could have been far more productive in life. But you know what? He, he was protecting his job. He was protecting his place by saying, I am the repository of all wisdom. I can do it. You can't. That wasn't the way it was with Pastor John. Pastor John was like a bumblebee going to get some nectar, pulling all the bumblebees with him, saying, here, this one's got a lot of nectar. He was impart about imparting value and encouraging in the life of others. And, and let me tell you that that is something that he has not just done, but he has imparted to the current pastoral staff. Okay, You may have noted on, on your bulletins today that there is, at, right after the second service, a Discover class. What is the Discover class? Well, that is where this, this pastoral staff believes that everyone in here is exactly what we said. You're a child of God, loved unconditionally by God. You've been gifted by God and are called by God to use those gifts for a special purpose. So the Discover class is intended to help you find what your gifting is, what your calling is, what really lights your fire so that you can use those gifts to help minister to the other people in this body. We are a body. Though your hand, you can't say the foot, the foot has won't need you. You're a part of this body. You have a place to function. You have a gift to function. You have an ability that God wants to use to help build the body of Christ. And so I encourage you, if you've not been to a Discover class, go to a Discover class. Learn how it is that you can be all that God wants you to be in this body. So anyhow, in March 1989, actually it's about March 10th, 
Um, for those of you who don't know how I know exactly when it was, it was a weekend the University of Illinois went up to Michigan and kicked their butts by 16 points in basketball, only lose them by four in the final four. But I'm over that. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> we went to Dayton, Ohio, and we went to this Apples of Gold seminar. Apples of gold, what does that mean? Well, if you read the Proverbs, it said, words aptly spoken are like apples of gold on platters of silver. What Pastor John and Barb had in mind is that we learn to communicate more effectively because if we can communicate more effectively, we can help one another, okay? And you think, well, gosh, that's pretty elementary. Well, yeah, it was, but you know, people like me, we really needed this stuff. So we get there, and this is a see and do type of seminar, okay? They say, these are the principles we want you to learn. We want you to learn to listen to reflectively. And so we get, we're one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm sitting there in this kind of face-to-face -face with this, this woman, and we're supposed to ask each other a question about our life. She starts asking me about my life. And within like a minute and a half, she says, look at yourself. I'm wrapped up in a fetal position. I had never been challenged that way by listening reflectively that much. So I came back and all of a sudden I understood, you know what? I can let people learn where they are just by reflecting back to them. What they're saying, it was an amazing learning experience. John, John, and, John and Barb were all about helping us to learn our personality types. And I mean, I, I can't tell you how many different places we went, how many different seminars we were, all intending to share with us the wisdom and knowledge of God that might help us fulfill our calling, use our gifts, be what God wants us to be so we could plug into God and do what we need to be doing for his kingdom. Um, <clears throat> the problem is, folks, we're not in this alone. We have an enemy. We have an entity. How many of you are, um, ever watched a TV, got online, and heard the phrase identity theft? You know, people, heck, there are companies that are designed to help protect your identity from being stolen. Well, the, the, the game of identity theft is not new. It's been going on from time immemorial. In fact, Satan entered the garden and he said to Eve, well, you don't need to listen to God. You can be God like yourself. It wasn't enough to be child of God, provided for by God. He wanted you to be God yourself. And that's really the same argument that goes on today. Do I have to listen to God? Do I have to obey God? Or can I be God myself? And so Satan wants to steal from us our identity, our identity as children of God, called by God, loved God unconditionally by God, gifted by God to be used for his eternal purposes. And so what we need to do is we need to step back and say, I am not going to allow him to steal my identity anymore. And we do that by learning what God has called us to be, what he's chosen to be. One of Pastor John's sayings was, if we aim at nothing, what? We're sure to hit it, Right? He also used to say insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. We're ambassadors. Do you like that? You read about the ambassador of France, the ambassador of China. We're, we're the ambassadors. We are ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 says that. We are ambassadors. We're to be trained up. We're to learn and to continue to learn so that we can represent him and be all that he wants us to be in his kingdom. You know, Pastor John in the last couple of years of his life, he, you know, he, even though he was weakened physically, he still had a strong drive. And look at me, all you guys who got gray hair. I want you to listen to me for a minute. He was all about us getting us off of our fannies and continuing to do the work of the kingdom. Because he, like me, sees, goes into coffee shops mid-morning and sees guys sitting on their hind end drinking coffee for two hours, settling the world problems, rather than being out in a school and mentoring a child for 20 minutes. He wants us guys to say, you've got a lifetime of learning. You've got a lifetime of blessing from God. Take what you've got. Help others learn. Use what God has given you. You've heard the expression, old dog, new tricks. Whoever said you were old in the first place? <laughs> my mother-in-law is 96. Al Vogel sings mother-in-law Donna's mom's 102. When are you going to die? Are you going to be die when you're 65? How old are you? I won't ask you that question. She's still growing up. She's still, Maureen, we're with you. She's still growing up. We have a lot to learn, but we have a lot to impart, okay? So why is it we're supposed to, we've talked about what we're supposed to learn. Why is it we're supposed to learn? Because it brings glory to God when we use the gifts he's given us to bring him glory. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. How many of you have children? One or two of you have children? How many of you get tickled to death when your kid does something that they're good at and they absolutely hit a home run at it? They do great. Sure, we love it. We love it. Guess what? 
We have a father in heaven who's exactly the same way. He says, you know what? I gifted that child to do that, and they're using that gift for my glory, and my, my buttons are bursting. God's bu buttons are bursting when we do the things he's called us to do using the gifts he's given us for his glory. That's why we do it. So how is it that we're to learn? We're to learn humbly. When I read that phrase, learn humbly, it almost seems to me like a du duplication of terms. What do you mean, learn humbly? Well, the only way you're going to learn is if you admit you got something to learn. The first step in this process is to find your red dot. Now, have you ever, have you ever heard the phrase red dot before? Okay. For those of you who shop in the mall, too embarrassed to say so, that's probably where you see that. You are here. It's your red dot. What does that mean? Well, the first stop, step in this learning process is find out where you are. Where are you spiritually? Where are you spiritually? James 1 talks about this. He says that we are to look into the perfect law of liberty and find out where we are. God's word says a proud look is an abomination. A lying tongue is an abomination. A lustful look is, is a great sin. He, he loves a cheerful giver. He expects patience to be the fruit of the spirit. Now I'm done talking about myself. How about some of you? Do those things challenge you? We're to look into the law of liberty and be changed by it. Part of this process, and here I go, is admitting there's some things we just don't want to learn. We just don't want to learn. We, we're comfortable with where we are. 30 years ago, I'm sitting in a chair in my house about 100 yards that way with some friends of ours who are um, from uh, out west in the state of Illinois. We're talking, and I'm really debating, you know, God, I'm kind of comfortable with where I am right now. I, I, I don't need any more. I don't need any more of you, which is insane. I need more of Jesus every day. My wife and I came to, to the Lord, and I'm going to give you a quote by a guy in a minute, but this guy named Larry Crabb wrote this book, and basically he said that everybody has two great needs in their lives. One's to be loved unconditionally, and only God can do that, and to be used for a purpose that will outlive your life so that there'll be something left of you after you're gone. And that only God's eternal purposes last forever. But I took that idea that only God can love us the way we want to be loved and said, okay, that, that means I don't have to do everything I can to love my wife as she deserves to be loved because that was my get out of jail free card. I can't do it perfect, so I'm not going to do as much as I should. And I'm still learning today, 30 years later, that that was an excuse and that I need to change in that regard. Another little example, we were on vacation with my oldest daughter and her kids and there's like three bedrooms and there's one common area and my sleep habits are a little different from my kids and my grandchildren. My daughter's a light sleeper because she's got a three-year-old that'll get up any time and take off. So she's a light sleeper. So I'm getting up at 3.34 in the morning and I want to go out in the commons area and read and have some coffee. Well, unfortunately, it wakes my daughter up. So my idea is, well, that's your problem. <laughs> and by the end of the week, my wife had finally beat me over the head with a two by four enough that she caused me to understand, is that really the example that you want to set for your children? Are you learning that your rights are superior to everybody else's or do you have the, the ability to subordinate your rights and desires to those around you? So yeah. I'm still learning. I woke up Friday morning and said, you know, this learning from mistakes thing, I, 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 I'm not quite sure what I know, can share about that. Not once, but twice Friday morning, I had to eat a great big plate of humble pie. I'm sitting in a room with seven other people. I made a mistake. Please forgive me. And you know what? It's not fun. But to learn, we have to learn first and foremost from our mistakes. How many of you ever had a car run out of gas? The gas gauge was a little bit empty. How many of you have ever had it happen more than once? <laughs> yeah. Why, why do we do that? Well, because we think I can get just a little bit further. Have your battery run out on your, your phone? Well, because I didn't plug it in. We have to learn from our mistakes. One of my pastor's recurring lines in his ministry was he'd re rehearse something that his mom used to say to him. He says, Johnny, you always have to learn the hard way. Well, the good news, folks, is he did learn. We have to learn from our mistakes. We have to learn from our mistakes. King David and the Apostle Peter, two of the most well-written about figures in the whole Bible, they made mistakes that were ginormous, huge, 
absolutely unbelievable. And yet God used them absolutely mightily. So we have to be willing to say what? I made a mistake. And there's a, there's a passage in Proverbs that ought to be something that we commit to memory. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. So what do we do when we make a mistake? You do exactly what I had to do in front of seven people at a closing at Chicago Titles on Friday morning. I made a mistake. Please forgive me. Let's try to fix it. It isn't easy because, you know what, we have this thing within us that says, I'm right, I'm good. And you know what? Get over it. We're not all perfect. You know, baseball players get paid a million dollars, hit 250. Basketball player who shoots 50% is thought of as a world beater. That means they're missing the baseball three quarters of the time. They're missing their shots 50%. They don't stand up and say, you know what, I'm sorry, I missed it. No. We have to learn that we all make mistakes, that we're human, but that God wants us to learn from our mistakes so that we can then help others learn from their mistakes. You know, in their, in their book <clears throat> that we, we base this series on, the Shooks use two Greek words. One has been translated masquerade, and the other one that's been translated metamorphosis. And I think they're great, great comparisons. And this, this man that, whose book I read many years ago, Larry Crabb, has this quote in the, the book Papa Prayer that, that I want to read to you. We live to pretend to hide what is bad and parade what is good. It prevents community from becoming grace-based and real, and it keeps us from enjoying God. I'm going to read that again because I want you to learn something here. We live to pretend what is high, hide what is bad and parade what is good. It prevents community from becoming grace-based and real, and it keeps us from enjoying God. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Barry was talking about passion. He was talking about preparing for the night alone, first night without his kids in a long time. He talked about all the preparations he went through, and it was like the light came on in his mind, and he said, wait a minute. When was the last time I spent time preparing for an intimate time alone with God that way? What he did is he let down the mask and said, wait a minute. Am I as concerned about intimacy with God as I am with my own wife? And what that does is it allows transparency and authenticity and grace to come in so that we understand that we all make mistakes, we're all still learning, and that we can build one another up in our most holy faith. We don't want to masquerade. We want to be, and I'll take a little literary liberty, we want to be metamorphosized. We want to be metamorphosized. We want to be transformed from the inside out. In Romans 12, Paul writes, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Transformed in your mind. How does that happen? How many of you are growing up had to eat vegetables? Didn't want them, didn't like them. I used to spit them out in the toilet. I think my mom knew. But she wanted me to eat vegetables. Why? So I'd get healthy. Well, we have this spiritual nourishment in the, in the form of the word of God, which sometimes we may not want because the devil doesn't want you to want it. And that word, empowered by the Holy Spirit, will allow our minds to be transformed, just as John and Barb were transformed, from chasing a world of real estate development to chasing the kingdom of God because their minds had been transformed. They found something better. They found something more appealing. They found something more lasting. And that's what God's calling us to learn. He's calling us not to masquerade, but to be metamorphosized. How do we change? We have to endure hardships. You know, I look around the room, and if if we had the time, and I took the microphone to everybody in the room, I'm sure that you could tell a story of hardship that you've endured in your life. Each one of us, each one of us has endured some hardship in our life. Hebrews 5, the, the, the writer says this, although he was a son, he's talking about Jesus now, he learned, he learned obedience from what? He suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all obey him. Though he were a son of God, he had to learn obedience through the things he suffered. You know, after Pastor John contracted cancer and went through surgery, and then became the laborious process of dealing with the chemo for years, 
And because we're friends, because I've been involved with the church, I had a lot of times to interact with him. Never once, never once did I hear him publicly complain about the lot that he had been given. Never once. Now, did he in his bed at home with his wife, did he lament? I would assume he did. You know, King David has been etched forever in eternity in his Psalms with his private laments. Why, God? How long, God? When are you going to do what I, you need to do? And it's not, God's your father. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to come to him and say, this isn't right, this isn't fair, but I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. So when we have hard times, we have to understand something that just another seminar that Pastor John took us to, Rick Warren, A Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren said this in in his Purpose Driven Life book. God is more interested in our character than our comfort. Now, you may have listened to and heard from about the God in the genie bottle that you rub the bottle and you get life as you want it, but that's not the God of the universe. Our God is more concerned about our character than our comfort. And, and one thing that the Shooks have said, and I saw in Pastor John as he was dying, you know, he didn't put up his feet and say, you know what, I've done a good job for a long time, I'm just going to rest as comfortably as I can. He still was at it. And when we have troubles in our life, we need to understand that God sometimes uses those com- troubles to draw us closer to him first and then help us to minister to those around us in need. And I promise you, as we pour out, we get our eyes off ourselves, and God has the ability to pour back in to our lives. To learn humbly, we need to let go. We need to let go. And two things, we need to let go of sometimes guilt. We can hang on to guilt for the things we've done wrong for a long time. And you know, God's forgetting them. If you've confessed them, you've forsaken them, he's cast them into a sea of forgetfulness. He doesn't even know them. Now, I don't know that that's really true because I don't think God can forget. But as it relates to your relationship with him, it's gone. It's done. So we have, if he's forgotten about it, we need to too. The other thing that we need to do is we need to sometimes, people just need to let go of some things so we can grab more of what God's got. Say, my life's full, my life's complete. Well, then you need to look at what you're hanging on to and say, could this be the real estate development that John and Barb had that we're going to let go of so that we can grab more of the purposes of God? Is there more, is there more for me on an eternal basis if I let go of this and I grab more of God? Lastly, we need to allow the power of God to replace the powerless self-help. This idea, if it's going to be, it has to be me. You know, the Apostle Paul started out, he's, he was the one who was going around, he was persecuting the Christians. And the longer he lived his life, the more he got in ministry, the more he felt how little he was because he saw how big God was. And rather than say, I can do it, what he said is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he's writing this letter and he's saying, you know, this power and weakness thing, I, I'm not quite sure I get it, but he finally figured it out in 2 Corinthians 12. He wrote to the Corinthians church, he says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, this hard thing that was going on. He called it a thorn in the flesh. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses. So what? That the power of Christ may reside in me. The power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the risen Savior can do all things. You know, as we come to Christ, as we get older in Christ, we learn We learn, you know, we said before you come to Christ, you're spiritually blind. But when you come to Christ, you start to see in part, you know in part. And as you grow, you find out how little you do know, but you see that he sees everything and wants to help everything. As we close today, I want to have you read this quote from the book. It's attributed to a Frederick Buechner. The place God calls you to is the place your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place God calls you to is the place your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Each one of us has been designed uniquely by God. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. We've been gifted by God. And he's gifted us so that we could be, just as John and Barb were on steroids that night in September 1978 because they were so filled with the joy of God, he wants to fill us so joyfully with his purposes that we are able to meet the onslaught of the enemy in the lives of other people and say, I know a better way. I know a savior who is able to give you life and give you more abundantly so you're no longer a victim, but
but now you're a victor through Christ Jesus. He wants you to have victory, and then he wants you to share that victory with others. God's gifted you. By all means, go to this, this lunch and find out what your gifting is. Find out what your calling is. Find out what your purpose is so that you can share the love of Jesus and understand that this learning is a lifelong process. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. We'd love to know how God is using this ministry to touch your life. So please take a moment and send us your story by going to ChristianLifeRantool.com and clicking Amen Central. Thanks again for joining us and we hope you enjoyed today's message.